journalist from Watkins Glen who writes in a blog, uh, the uh, Waterfront law Online blog. And uh, I'll let him take it from here because we are cutting on time. Will this work right here? I think, let's try it. See if the mic works. Okay, well, um, since I've, I've written this, this is easier to just sit down. Um, well, thank you, Ann, and your team for putting this together and for inviting me. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm a career journalist. I live in Watkins Glen. I've been writing about environmental issues in the Finger Lakes for about a decade. Um, most of that time was for a, uh, a website based in Washington, D.C. that is now defunct. And um, about two years ago, well, not quite, uh, I guess it was uh, in the fall of 17, I started writing my own blog uh, called Waterfront. And I've got some uh, cards on the table in the, in the back. Um, I have a personal stake in this because I live in Watkins Glen, um, but I also own a, uh, a cottage on the west side of Seneca Lake. Uh, so as I, I can even see the deterioration of the lake uh, progressing. Um, my blog is a pro bono effort. I don't take any, uh, it's not a money making uh, enterprise at all. I don't take any advertising. I don't, uh, I don't uh, take financial support even though a couple of people have offered it. I'm just trying to keep it clean so that the, the biases in it are all mine and the errors too. So uh, um, anyway, um, I have a, a somewhat dark view of where the media is right now. Um, I'll just say that, that back in the good old days of journalism, back in the 70s and 80s, Many towns and cities had two newspapers that competed. And that competitive environment tended to produce highly motivated reporters. Quite a few were already fueled by the outrage over uh, Nixon's um, misuse of power in Watergate. And they, uh, a lot of these reporters really dug deep for scoops. And that's even become a kind of quaint old term. It's not really used much anymore. But back then, there were states like Florida and Ohio and North Carolina. Uh, each had at least half a dozen really good newspapers. They were, they were very aggressive. And they tended to set the public agenda, and, uh, and they drove public policy. My first paper, the Winston-Salem Journal, um, won the 1971 public, uh, Pulitzer Public Service Award for campaigning to save the New River from a strip mining project on the North Carolina-Virginia border. I landed at that, uh, I landed straight out of college um, into that group of real rabble-rousing reporters who were really talented folks. Now, in those days, TV reporters just about always followed print reporters. Obviously, there was no internet, there was no social media. So it's a, it's a totally different world today, although TV has not really changed very much. Um, you know, as we know, the uh, market forces have really killed two, two newspaper town comp uh, in one town competition. And even some of the best papers have been driven into full retreat with layoffs and buyouts. Um, the once powerful and progressive Atlanta Constitution, which was my workplace from 1983 to 2000, um, it's gone so far as to, to quit endorsing political candidates. Uh, so as not to scare off readers. Um, then it sold its main downtown office building and went slinking off to a suburban strip mall. This is the largest newspaper in the South, you know, so. And I'm glad I left before all that went down, but I could see the writing on the wall and where it was going. Um, but upstate New York is not at all immune. Uh, earlier this year, a predatory hedge fund, Alden Global Capital, made a hostile bid for uh, the Gannett chain, which includes papers in Rochester, Ithaca, Elmira, and Binghamton, among others. So why did they do this? Basically for the value of the office buildings. Um, it's just a raid on their, their real estate, That's, and also their, their uh, pension funds. Um, journalism is really totally beside the point. So, um, so how does all of this relate to effective water law today? And this is where it gets a little negative, I think, but uh, I just, I feel that people in this room who want to use the law to protect the environment have to do it pretty much without the help of traditional journalism. 
Uh, the fact is that the national news landscape is increasingly barren, and we live in a, in a virtual news desert here in the Finger Lakes. Now, obviously there are exceptions. Um, the New York Times has uh, Ian Urbina. Um, Gannett has a couple of very good reporters, but they're stretched really thin. Um, the Finger Lakes Times in Geneva and Finger Lakes One, which is a news aggregator, they try really hard. But what's, what's different now is the, the journalists are not really the drivers um, that they once were. And in fact, it's strategic activists, people like, like Walter and like, uh, like Seneca, like Guardian, they're doing a lot of the, of the real true digging that used to be done a couple, you know, 20 or 30 years ago by journalists. Um, so the strategic activists are, to a certain extent, I think, filling, uh, filling the gap. Um, but the problem is that the general pub public is sort of out of the loop, in my opinion. Um, in the old newsrooms, we used to joke about dumbing our stories down for Aunt Martha, who was a mythical stand-in for people of either sex who knew absolutely zero about an issue being covered. The goal was to, to write simply and concisely and to educate. And as Aunt Martha gradually wised up from her reading the daily paper, she often got engaged. And that caused her to light a fire under local politicians. But uh, today's Aunt Martha isn't well exposed to critical environmental issues or many other facts. No one teaches him or her, and he or she is out of touch and indifferent. And that lack of interest and passion allows local politicians to get lazy and dumb. And for example, um, in 2010, I asked the mayor of Watkins Glen whether she had any concerns about a proposal to store liquid petroleum gas under enormous pressure in unlined salt caverns next to Seneca Lake, two miles from her town. You heard about that earlier. Uh, she dismissed it. She said, oh, that's an issue for the neighboring town of Reading, not Watkins Glen. She saw no pressing need for an environmental impact statement. That local indifference helps explain why the state waited almost a year to order one. Decisive local leadership might have stopped that reckless project in its tracks early on. Instead, uh, LPG storage, that victory um, over LPG storage, took nearly a decade of hard work by the water law network in this room, but really gas-free Seneca led it. Um, and that was Joe Campbell and Yvonne Taylor. They were really important in that. Uh, but I will say that that win might not have ever come about without one good old-fashioned scoop. Um, back in 2012, I'd been looking into the LPG project for a couple of years for the, for the Washington uh, website. Um, and I'd been poking through uh, FOIL documents, and I ran across a 20-year-old uh, letter. It was written by a cavern engineer named Larry Sevenker. And uh, it detailed some of the structural problems with the proposed caverns. The letter uh, included a phone number in Louisiana. This is 20 years, you know, 20 year old letter. So taking an extreme long shot, I just said, what the heck, I'll call the number. And amazingly, Larry picked up the phone. <laughs> and what was even more amazing to me was he started spilling details about the cavern flaws even though he was still employed by the people that own the caverns and were trying to do the LPG storage. So he starts telling me all this. On the phone, he reinforced the points he'd made decades earlier in his letters to his bosses and the DEC. I wrote um, Larry's story for the Washington website, and um, that January 2013 article had two important, caused two important reactions. The first was Larry's employers, the people proposing the LPG storage in the caverns. They called him in Louisiana and explained that he needed to immediately write a letter of retract retracting the things that he told me on the record. The company official who called was super helpful to Larry. He provided the exact wording for his letter of retraction, which the company PR Flax then shopped to Finger Lakes Media. 
local papers and TV stations duly reported on the retraction letter without proper context. Meanwhile, though, Deborah Goldberg of Earth Justice also saw the article on Seven Curve. She was moved enough to commit that month to represent Gaspari Seneca in the fight to kill the LPG plan. It's my view, and this may not be shared by everyone, um, that Earth Justice was the critical piece in the opposition network that killed that plan. It lined up the, the compelling ex expert witnesses, including Ray over there. Um, it uh, formulated the legal rationale that allowed uh, the DEC's uh, Sagos to overrule his own staff. Yes, uh, We Are Seneca Lake mattered too. It, it sent hundreds of protesters to Crestwood's gate and dozens of them went to jail. And certainly the lobbying uh, in Washington by the wine and business folks was a factor. And Gasfrey Seneca's direct lobbying with the governor's staff, all that definitely matters. But what you have to remember is that, that Sagos and Cuomo needed a cogent legal justification to go against the, the formal recommendation of their own staff, um, which wanted to grant the permit in spite of all the facts. Um, and that's what Earth Justice provided. In the end, it was, it was the network that stopped that really bad project from harming the Finger Lakes. It was lawyers, it was scientists, it was strategic activists, protesters at the gate, journalists, and others who had a role in turning the tide, I think. Um, I will say also, I think, I think there's still a place for scoop journalism to help in this whole process. Um, and I think it probably has helped in at least a few, a few other environmental cases in the Finger Lakes. Just two weeks ago, the New York Senate unanimously passed a bill to ban new garbage incinerators in the Finger Lakes. And the, the Assembly's already passed it, and the governor is all but certain to sign it. He's got a few more days now, but I think he probably will sign it. But in November 2017, the plan to build the state's largest incinerator in Romulus, halfway between Seneca and Cayuga Lakes, was very much in play. The campaign contributions were flowing to key politicians, including Cuomo. Um, so acting on a tip that month, I wrote an article on my blog about a Romulus code officer who had quietly provided a favorable zoning interpretation for the um, incinerator developer. And they'd, they'd, go on, they'd even go on to the point of getting a public notice uh, in, the, in, a new, in a newspaper to provide the legal, the legal step that had to be taken. But virtually no one on the, on the local zoning board, the planning board, or the town board itself had any idea he'd taken that critical step. And, and I don't even know if they even knew about the public notice that uh, this step had been taken. Meanwhile, that same code officer had a piece of property on, uh, that was nearly adjacent to the incinerator site. And he decided it was a good time to sell. So he, he sold to a hapless buyer um, who, was a, who turned out to be a very sympathetic uh, family man named Felix Flores. Um, a fair amount of outrage in that in that story. I mean, you're not going to disclose something like that. Um, and it also, I think, maybe gave people a hint of what they were dealing with. They were dealing with a with a newly formed LLC that would not disclose its ownership. So we didn't know who we were dealing with. We could just see how they were acting. <clears throat> um, that story did, I think, help galvanize public opinion in the region and help spur local officials to take stands against the project. Um, once again, though, the, the credit for that environmental victory, or near victory, because it isn't signed yet, uh, needs to go to the, to the network, not to any one individual or group. Um, the Finger Lakes has significant environmental challenges ahead. These landfills, halves and cyanobacteria, PFOA, is, uh, that's going to be huge. Um, coal ash, hot spots, just, those are just a few. Um, in each case, the network, I think, is already deeply engaged. And I plan to try to keep doing my, you know, my part it, to explain and to frame the issues, and maybe occasionally even prodding things along with a, one of these old-fashioned scoops. But scoops are often developed from tips, so don't be shy. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's it.
quick, anybody? Any questions? I know I have a, a negative view of the media, but. We need 50 columns of new view. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, in our case with the Queen and the Covey Cargill, um, we, well, I actually, I speak for myself, have often speculated that if you did. And I was able to find, you know, a, a, a you know, a very clear link. And it, that does matter if, if, if you have, um, if you have someone in a, uh, who's that close to the governor, who has a direct interest in this project, that matters. You can have the law, but I mean, uh, lobbying and political influence are uh, not to be discounted. I actually have a, a question for you. Um, what about like things like Instagram and like I know that isn't maybe the type of media we are, we were discussing, but um, I mean, how does that impact? I mean, is there like anything out there? Well, I myself I, don't know. I would say that that all of social media, I mean, the internet and all of social media has really helped this network, and I think it's it's one of the reasons that 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 the strategic activists and the and the network are able to be, to begin to replace journalism in a way. And I, and I think that, you know, that's just part of social media. It's why we all communicate so much better. We share data better. We just communicate among ourselves. Unfortunately, I think the public is largely out of that loop. Yeah. Yeah, I, we had a problem with our case uh, getting enough attention from the larger, you know, conventional media. We were getting local coverage amongst the, the organizations organizations that my clients were affiliated with were certainly posting and using social media and it was a lot of that sort of thing. But it's very difficult to, to get, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, whatever. Right. We're very you know, we're twenty miles from New York City. To, to to even pay attention to it unless but when James Cromwell <coughs> refused to go to jail, yeah. it was all over the newspapers because he had been a won an Oscar. So you know well, one, other, and then one last thing, and, and to the extent that we did get coverage by more conventional media, it was way off on text. I mean, huge mistakes. I mean, yeah. enormous mistakes. Well, so, I mean, is there is there an approach? And it's really not my job as a lawyer. It's really my clients and, and the and the community around them that have to work that side of the street. Do you have any tips on how to get one more national and major media coverage, and secondly, a more accurate coverage? Well. You know, it's funny you should ask because it's that's mainly just because they don't have the staff to cover things. It's not that your issue is not incredibly valid, but even when I was in Atlanta, I would get flooded with, "Hey, you got to take on this story and investigate this." Well, it's easy to have like an idea. But it's a whole different ball game to actually bring it to fruition as a as a fully formed story. It's very hard to do that. So it's a matter of resources. Why you're maybe not getting the response from the New York Times that you would want. Even my wife tells me when I have a good story, call the New York Times and I say, Laura, they're not gonna listen to me. It doesn't work that way anymore. It just, it doesn't. The problem is that back in the, in the old days when there were a lot of competing newspapers, there were a lot of reporters who had expertise. That's what's really been eroded tremendously. That's why you're getting the high error levels and stuff like that. But just reporters who, they're young, they're inexperienced, and um, it's just not, not what it used to be, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you, you have the same issue in writing about climate change and our attempt to come up with some new sustainability um, the, the opposition published something uh, on their website, and maybe in a local paper, I'm not quite sure, no, like a free paper that people tend to be verbal, uh, saying we were going to ban wood burning boilers, which we wouldn't have done because we're a very rural town. It's just not you know, at all. But it turned out everybody was forced <laughs> to say that, that climate change didn't exist, and, right. uh, and by the way, you know, you have no right to take away our kids' blood. So just uh, just say it. Sometimes it takes a lie to bring up the crowd. Apparently. Yeah, that's that's the problem I think when with the public being sort of out of the loop of, of real fact of real information, and they're not you know they're all 
they have feelings about things, but they don't have factual based positions. Actually, I think we're going to have to uh, move on to our next speaker. I'm sorry about that. That's fine. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you.